Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And let's give up for all you doing inside. All right, and this, right now we'll open up the Q&A section. Um, if there's anybody who would like to ask any questions, we can call you up maybe like two at a time. And then there's this mic right up front that we can get set up for you all. Thank you very much for this call and being here. Um, I wanted to know uh, kind of what your opinions are about maybe what formal tribal governance has to play in interfacing with some of these multinational extractive corporations. So the biggest thing is that most tribal governments do not have a say when interacting with these um, corporations. So if we look at specifically, so I'm, I'm from Black Mesa. So if we look at the HPL, MPL, Hopi partition lands that happened, and we talked about it in the film, what happened in the 1950s is they actually renegotiated the treaty lines of the reservation borders. And so if the treaty line for the Hopi reservation then got drawn along the coal seam because the Hopi reservation said yes and the Navajo reservation said no. So even if these um, political and tribal-like governments are saying no, these uh, larger corporations are able to use finances to buy their way into it no matter what. And even um, when I was 16, I was at a Navajo tribal council meeting where Peabody Coal was um, renegotiating for another 20 years of um, mining. And one, so there were two tribal council members who were actually watching porn while elders from Black Mesa were speaking, and I have it on footage. Um, and then when um, these other elders started to go up and continue, Peabody Cole actually interrupted the tribal council meeting with KFC and um, completely took over the time that was allotted for these indigenous elders to be speaking against um, them renegotiating the treaties. So, and the tribal council just allowed for it to happen because they got free food out of it. Um, so there is no negotiation between these two. And the only reason that Peabody Cole and BHP left the Navajo Nation is because they filed for bankruptcy in 2016. It wasn't like they were forced out, they, they went bankrupt and that was it. They're still technically allowed to mine all pre-mined coal. So what they did, um, they had one year of being able to fully run and they just like blew up. There was clouds of smoke in the sky for weeks and months on end um, where they were blowing up um, the, along the coal seam. And anything that was pre-mined, they have the next 20 years, which I think they've been going for five, so they have 15 more, to be able to continue pulling it out of the ground and selling it. So, yeah, so there really isn't any <laughs> communication between the tribes and these um, larger corporations, and that's where we need especially a lot of other support. Um, a lot of these tribes have their, we have federally recognized tribes, state recognized tribes, and then neither federally nor state recognized tribes, and especially the ones that are neither federally nor state recognition actually need help in becoming recognized um, for e even just bare minimum state recognition um, in order to be able to have a foot in the door to be able to talk to these corporations. And then when those tribal council meetings show up, um, of course we need tribal members, but also other people being able to and willing to go out and support is very important. Because the uranium mining that happened in Arizona, it is polluting um, Utah, Nevada, California, New Mexico, and all of Arizona because they were not contained properly and because they're on the reservation and most people don't know about them, it's still affecting. So because all of this is still affecting everyone else, please come out and support and please show mm -hmm. for all of it. I think the best message for the film is hopefully uh, you can look in your own backyard and find a way to help. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Bonnie. Uh, thank you so much for this film. I learned so much and it was really moving um, seeing folks talk about their experiences. I had two questions. The first was I was really, really struck by how much um, that the film was grounded in the culture of folks, right? Like in the traditions, um, whether that be spiritual or natural or healing justice, right? Like in the tradition of indigenous peoples. Um, and I found that to be an interesting contrast with some of some folks on the environmental justice movement who say that, you know, uh, climate justice is grounded purely in science, right? Like, listen to the science and things like this, right? Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that, uh, the necessity to ground it in uh, indigenous traditions and things like that when we think about intersectional issues such as climate justice. Um, and then the second question is, um, I think it was really powerful to have so many different international um, solidarity efforts, like across different struggles around the world highlighted in the film. Um, and I was wondering if y'all could maybe speak to um, maybe the positionality of that or the difficulties in establishing solidarity maybe, right? Like, um, obviously all these communities are affected by multinational corporations that are harming folks, but 
uh, each context is kind of different, uh, right? People are contending with their local governments, and um, I was really reminded by, uh, there was a really famous case in the 1990s, um, Awasitini versus Nicaragua in the Inter-American Court. It was the first, uh, you know, court case in the Inter-American Court where uh, indigenous community were able to assert land rights through kind of ancestral and spiritual claims, which is so important, but I was really kind of sad end of that case was it was against like a so-called left-wing government, right? The Sandinistas who just kept delaying and delaying, delaying land rights. So yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about establishing solidarity across these different contexts and um, maybe, yeah, things that you found while making the film and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So one thing that I found is a lot of indigenous um, cultures and teachings actually are rated, like, rooted deep within science. And uh, mm -hmm. so, for example, uh, traditionally we call our coal seam in Black Mesa, we've known it as the liver of Mother Earth. And do you know why? Because the liver purifies, it helps to cleanse things, it cleanses our water for us. Well, you know what science is now saying, we need this coal in the ground to be able to purify water. It's one of the only sources that can actually remove estrogen from um, non-potable reclaimed water sources. It's like the only way to make it potable is coal. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, it's one of those where it's like, it may not be like sciencey science, but it's definitely, you can see these, um, the continuities mm -hmm. between the two. And so I think it's very possible to look at science and indigenous teachings and see that they are, they should be working together. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to be working together. And numbers and math isn't all there is. We've been, um, yeah. They're also finding that a lot of our ways, they're, they're finding that we've been doing brain surgery, you know, a thousand years ahead of a lot of um, Western tribe or Western um, societies. And a lot of that came with colonization, you have to wipe and eradicate a whole bunch of your history, your knowledge, your teachings. And so, you know, Europe was colonized by Rome and then Europe then colonized here. And so we have this like, this whole like se series of colonizations that wipe out and eradicates all of our indigenous teachings and all of our ways. And one of the biggest things that I like to remind people is everyone's indigenous to somewhere, mm -hmm. so behave like you're indigenous. And I, I think that's the most simple way to put it, is uh, we all come from the same place, which is the, this rock floating through space, mm -hmm. right? And um, we're all stuck on it together. And so if indigenous teachings and science teachings can both help to better both of them, why not use both together? Mm -hmm. I, I hope that answered it. <laughs> okay. And then just to tie into what you were saying, uh, Ivy, um, regarding your questions here, um, myself as, you know, being a person, you know, as you see the film uh, from the land of my family, the main thing that your question brings to mind um, as far as when it comes to like healing the land. So that's one thing that I primarily focus on is how we heal the land and body as one. Mm -hmm. um, so your questions around like Western medicine and, you know, Western society, science, science in general, there is a core balance um, that I've come to find when it comes to inherent like indigenous teachings, them being so old that nowadays they're so new. You know, when you look mm -hmm. at plant-based diets, you know, things that a lot of indigenous communities have been teaching for since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. And those are those inherent things. And the biggest thing that I can see when I go into different communities is the challenge of the actual dialogue. You know, just like you were saying here before in the previous question when it comes to like tribal governments and how a lot of like black and brown communities are held outside of these, are not let into these meetings and when they are let into these meetings to be addressing things, the vocabulary isn't there. Um, a lot of the times, especially at, you know, even the socials conference, the vocabulary is way, be way above these actual communities that we need to be working within and building solidarity with. Mm -hmm. So when it brings back to your question here, when it comes to the second part of your question, when it comes to what um, the vastness of the indigenous global stance yeah. of what solidarity looks like, you know, it goes beyond a little bit for me, you know, looking between our backyards because I've done a lot of work in the Southwest primarily, but the biggest learning curve for myself is getting outside of my own community in order to build solidarity, to build new you know, strategic ways to help break down these companies because like um, Ivy Camille says, you know, like we all are indigenous to somewhere and even if you don't see it at your forefront or you've never been to your own indigenous community, you know, there's a lot of connections that can be made that will help you find, honestly, your way back to your own inherent self and your own indigeneity. Kind of building off of that question, I'm curious more um, about in the specific fights that were documented in the film, how or if um, 
there were like partnerships across like international lines, international solidarity around taking down these companies that have like corporate offices in the U.S. Even if they're doing the mining activities in the Philippines or um, you know in other places, how or if like did those groups um, on the ground, the indigenous communities, were they able to build partnerships with like organizers who could target um, the corporations like where they're headquarters were, things like that, how did those partnerships work? Yeah, so we definitely were able to start building a lot of partnerships. Um, so this this film took seven years to make, and mm -hmm. we started filming it uh, seven, seven, almost eight years ago now at this point. Um, and so like truthfully, a lot of these communities did not have access to running water, electricity, or the internet, and so being able to stay in touch became really difficult. And so there's, it's, it's a little more feasible now, and we've gotten a huge spread. I just worked with some Colombian activists in Colorado last week. Um, so yeah, like, there's definitely a, a really great spread that's happening, happening currently, but when the film was being made and when it was the easiest to set up those partnerships, a lot of those places didn't have access to a way to stay in touch, and so we're currently in the process of rebuilding them. But this was for sure a large scale, like global project. Like my editor lives in Fresno, and I've got, the sound designers in LA, and we got a producer in England, and we were working with companies based out of like the Philippines, and so it was like very widespread. Um, and so a lot of the research and spread out, we kind of had to like separate and do. And so uh, Jordan and I were on every single aspect of it, but it was definitely it would be like, okay, Ava, can you go and work <laughs> on this portion in the Philippines with these people, and then we put connections into place afterwards. But we're definitely still building connections, and ironically enough, things like TikTok are like really being able to mm -hmm. help spread mm -hmm. and connect these communities. Um, so follow your native TikTokers. <laughs> yeah. And then if anything, I feel like uh, this film is a great representation, and I feel like we'll look forward onto what the potential impact of indigenous solidarity can actually look like. You know, for me personally, this film is a is a great example of that. So, you know, taking that question, I feel like the door is open to really figure out what that looks like within like your own community, and then reaching out. You know, these spaces and these can these type of gatherings, you know, they're meant to build solidarity. You know, a lot of it is just pushing past like our own our own feelings of putting ourselves out there and reaching out to communities. You know, because you know sometimes <coughs> it is hard to figure out where to start. And what that looks like, but you know, overall, I feel like this film is going in that direction and building that type of example for communities. Um, I don't really have a, a question, but I, I just wanted to share a few words. Um, I, I just wanted to say thank you for um, putting that together. I, I, like, I got emotional watching it, so I can't imagine, you know, how much emotional labor it, it took you to create, and especially over, you know, seven or eight years. Um, I'm, I'm from unceded Algonquin territory, which is occupied and has been occupied colonially known as Ottawa. And in uh, the, there's an Algonquin word, miigwech, which is thank you. thank you. And Ottawa as well is now home uh, more recently to the Inuit and in uh, the Inuktitut dialect that I learned, Huyanamik means thank you. And, and language is like such an important connector mm -hmm. in building solidarity as well. So. I want to encourage you know folks to not only learn the, the names of the people um, and you know whose land they're on, but also try and start learning the language and let's move away from this English colonial language. <laughs> so side note, miigwech is a Salish word. There's Code Salish and Salish, and it uh, talks about specific uh, tribes. So miigwech is thank you all the way from Washington up until Alaska to. Um, this side of the states in Canada, like, yeah, so miigwech goes all the way across the northern border of Canada and um, the U.S. So if you say miigwech to any, and you go miigwech, any native tribe will understand <laughs> what it means. <laughs> Everyone learns it for now. <laughs> Thank you. So we do have a few more minutes. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Are there any questions, comments? Um, yeah, I... Well, first I want to say thank you for um, making a film that spotlighted, spotlights um, current indigenous resistance and victories. Um, I think, yeah, I think it can be galvanizing for a lot of people and it's really important um, to show that that work is being done and that it works. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, um, so in all the different forms of resistance that you showed in the film, 
um, the, the people's, the New People's Army in the Philippines seem to be the only, um, like, black, like all, all, form, all the forms of resistance were militant, but um, People's Army, the New People's Army was um, armed in their militancy. And because of um, state violence, um, it prevented solidarity between the NPA and um, the, the tribe that was being labeled as New People's Army and being massacred in response. And I'm wondering, um, yeah, if, if you could talk more about um, like how and if that solidarity should be um, uh, cultivated between um, like in those in similar situations. Yeah. So at the time, the Philippines was the most dangerous um, space, like place on earth, to be a land defender or protector of it. Um, currently, Colombia and the Philippines are fighting for first place as most dangerous. Um, and so there are a lot of people in Colombia who are currently talking about going into that militant state as well, because when you were constantly being shot at and killed and massacred, there gets to a point where you can't put up with it anymore and you have to start defending yourself. And if they have guns, then you need guns as well. Um, it's a question we get a lot, and I'm not saying that everyone should become militant and like start a communist army where you're out dancing with your machine guns, but it's definitely, that that is, Part of why we put it into the film is this this is an option. And so we tried to show this wide range. There's peaceful protest, there's cultural recognition, there's also arms. I'm not saying it would work everywhere. Uh, it's just just a friendly reminder. Yeah. It's always an option. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely always an option, especially when you look at like historical, you know, there's plenty of movements without history. You know, at one end you have people who are in the courtrooms, you know, they're all these, all these different strategies are part of, you know, what we see as quote unquote the bigger picture, right? Everybody has an initial role to play, whether it be the healers, the um, the people in the streets, you know, protesting, putting their bodies online, the people in the courtrooms, you know, there's just like a really vast variety of ways that you can approach this, and that's the biggest thing about, you know, building solidarity is like you find a place in what you know your calling is, and you just you just do it, you know. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to say on that topic that uh, the state and the military, you know, whether they really thought that the family was part of that military, uh, you know, it, that's just part of their repressive forces to divide because the being, you know, opposed by military forces is a threat to them. So that's, you know, if, if they're going to have weapons, we're going to have to have weapons too. Well, and they would have had weapons and massacred those families, whether or not there were weapons. Exactly. Yeah. And, exactly. Yeah, and I mean, you look at Standing Rock, do you know how many people got like severely hurt and injured and to this day are going to be living with uh, disabling injuries because of the military force that was used against them? And those were peaceful protests. I was there. There were constantly, like it was war tactics that were happening. Um, they would be having floodlights shining all night long, they would be flying low helicopters and planes. They were literally using like war tactics upon not just U.S. citizens, but First Nation people, like people who have been here, people who are in the middle of a current genocide. Um, and that's how they were targeting and attacking us. And if we had picked up a single weapon, we would have been instantly um, labeled as terrorists and thrown into jail and all this. Like we didn't have that as an option. But without weapons, we were being brutalized on the daily. Uh, and it's happening everywhere uh, on these front lines. You can look at what happened on J20. The, um, there's constantly snakes in these protests who are going in and starting these riots and putting these things out there. We always have to be the bigger person in order to survive the US military component that is hanging over all of our heads. Uh, but yeah, just it's, there's another option. There's a friendly reminder. <laughs> <laughs> Just a comment, I just saw a lot of parallels in some work that we're doing. We're producing a film on very similar issues on the African continent um, with indigenous communities and our resistance against colonialism. Um, and I just thought um, could maybe uh, resource or exchange uh, information and just talk about your experience because you know I'm not a filmmaker by trade, but <laughs> I've uh, gotten into the uh, business of it. So I'll. Uh, after, can talk to you about that. Yeah, do it. And if you need help and contacts, I have a couple. 
Okay, hey, thanks for the, thanks for the showing. Um, okay, a few questions. I wasn't really sure what actually made them leave the Philippines location, the, the company. And so, I was like, you know, was it really the military response of, you know, that they were protecting using military force? Or was it something else? Do we really know? Um, it was both, and maybe there's more that we don't fully understand. Um, but so like what Celeste said earlier about how we're, we were all working at different levels. Somebody's doing legal, somebody's on the front line, somebody's doing military. It's the combination of all of these um, people finally being able to push and force these places out. Because okay. um, yeah, sometimes the legal drug is just too, it's too much, and those communities don't understand those big words, and they like, are never going to be able to go forward on that front. Sometimes um, the military force is going to be the exact reason why the, the corporations turn on them. Sometimes so it's that multi-layer level of a bunch of different um, people working together. Yeah. So everyone take a different tactic and we'll take over something. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> and then another question, uh, how can we share this? Uh, do we buy it? Do we donate? Is it free yes. somewhere? Um, so if you would like to donate and continue to support us, you can go to powerlands.org. Uh, we still need help funding all the time. Um, also, if you'd like to bring it to your community, if you are through education, you can go through Good Docs um, or powerlands.org, as well as currently we are streaming on Fuse Plus, which is a new streaming service that was, um, Fuse was a music TV station in the early 2000s, and then they got bought out for this like queer POC documentary filmmakers, and now they're releasing a whole bunch of really cool um, different filmmaking uh, stuff at the moment, so you should check out the full streaming service. But we are currently on that as well. It's $1.99 a month, so pretty cheap. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.